So recently, the Bible Society of Australia let me film their weekly devotions that they do in the workplace and see their setup. Now, I think this is a super interesting case study for you to look at if you're interested in running a hybrid presentation or workshop or seminar. And what's that, you ask? Well, it's when you run one of those synonyms I just said for both in-person and online participants simultaneously, where every participant can contribute or interact with every other participant. For making any setup like this, I always have four rules. Rule number one, I want this setup to be cheap and reliable. This means using the latest gear that helps us achieve these new features, plus gear you might have lying around. Now, when we do go for cheaper, I keep the 80-20 rule in mind. We're gonna be able to achieve the majority of functions we need at this price, but if you want that little extra thing or come up against the edge, well then it starts to cost a lot just to get that little bit extra. Rule number two, I want this setup to be versatile. You might be able to tell from the title that I couldn't decide what this thing was or what it achieved, but I want it to be able to work for workshops, hybrid presentations, small scale Bible studies, whatever you can imagine where there are multiple people in person and online where both are contributing. Rule three, I want the set to be mobile. Workshops or breakout sessions can happen anywhere or anytime. This isn't specifically designed for a main auditorium. However, the principles will still apply and translate to that context because of rule number two. Rule number four, it needs to be operated by one person at a minimum. Oh, and it should scale up or down easily, be user-friendly, retrofit into existing AV systems. But those go without saying. And we want to be able to use that setup to create four different experiences. When I say experience, I mean good experience. The first two are pretty obvious. We're creating an experience for the people in the room. And we're creating an experience for online participants. So these are guests, speakers, classes of people joining, whatever. Number three, we're creating an experience for the online viewer. What? What's the difference? Well, you might not need this group, but this is like a workshop that you want others to experience by watching. They might not need to interact, um, but this other online group, maybe they want to watch and learn in real time as well. So this is kind of like an outer experience. You, you have the Zoom people who can all interact and then we're taking this whole workshop to be seen in real time online or after the fact. Which the fourth experience speaks to, the editor's experience. I not only want this experience to be seamless for the first three, but after the fact, I want this setup to be able to record everything for posterity, archiving, or to be repackaged in the editing room at a later date. So you can fix any incorrect camera cards, camera cards. you can hide a whole camera, you can cut dead air. Maybe you're even turning that workshop into a product later. Now, that's versatile. So let's see an example of this. So the BSA, they have a main office in Sydney, but they also have other offices in Sydney and remote working teams around the country. Each week, they bring everyone together for announcements, prayer and devotions. And you have segments led by people who are either in person or on Zoom. They do this by having the presentation run from the Sydney office studio and the other groups tune in via Zoom. Then on top of that, they live stream the whole devotion on Facebook Workplace for individual employees who are working from home, but don't necessarily need to be a part of Zoom phone call. In this case, they're not re-editing the content, but they do record the devotion in a quality that's higher than what Facebook records in the live stream. So what gear do they use? Let's start with the three cameras. The first, a GH5 with an 18 to 45 millimeter lens. The camera is on a tripod dolly so that it can quickly be moved around the room and they use a field world monitor to help focus better. The monitor has HDMI pass through so the cables go into the monitor and then back out into the switcher. Could either be a mid shot or a wide angle for interviews. Camera number two is a G85 with a 45 to 150 millimeter lens. This gets the front on wide shot, which can show a speaker and the front of our screen. And this is actually a really cheap lens, but you don't need an expensive lens when you have adequate lighting and you're just using it for the job you know it needs to do. And the next G85, the third camera, uses a 35 to 100 millimeter lens, which is quite a bit more expensive because it has a lower f-stop of 2.0. 
This is a nicer lens, great for other applications, but you would not need a lens this expensive to get the mid shot they're getting. Side note, this is a perfect example of wise investment into a versatile set of cameras. You don't need three A cameras. The GH5 is an A camera. It's a lot more expensive than the G85, but the G85 doesn't need to be the GH5 because both images match perfectly in this situation because they have the same color science and resolution. I love versatility. That's why my primary recommendation is mirrorless cameras because you can take them out of a studio context or live stream context or this hybrid context and you could shoot amazing content anywhere else. You can't do that with a PTZ and camcorders aren't really built for that kind of thing and just don't look as good. But anyway, the studio itself has a couple of ceiling mounted LED panels, two key lights and a backlight which separates the speaker nicely from the black curtain which is on rails and has racks behind it for storage. They've got a lectern, the TV is on rollers and they use this to either show an online participant, a zoom room, a logo or slides if a speaker has one. They got those nice practical lights just for a bit of and they have some paper rolls as backdrops. So in the same studio set, they can create a variety of looks for different projects. In terms of audio, there's a speaker in the room and this is purely for amplifying the Zoom participants' audio. The speakers in the room, because it's small enough, they actually don't need amplification, but technically you could amplify them if they wanted to. Now, to actually capture the speaker, they've got two wireless microphones and two wireless lapel microphones. They've also got a confidence monitor for the speaker up the front so they can see what's currently going on. Pause. Hey, editor Alex here. If you like this kind of content, why don't you like the video? It actually really helps out the channel. And since it's brand new, you can also see that 99% of watchers aren't subscribed. So no pressure, uh, but you could do that too if you want, but you may as well hit the bell if you're going to, because otherwise you'll never see what we do. Anyway, back to the show. So how do they do this without getting feedback, without making it seamless so everyone can hear? It's actually a lot easier than you think once you understand it and put in the work like I've done for you. So hopefully it's easy for you. Here are all the elements that we need. And we need all of this to be live streamed and easily recorded. I mean, technically you could just record in every camera, but that's not easy because you've got to sync them up later. This is a terrible task. Trust me, I know. There are two cornerstone piece of gear to make this happen. The first is the sound mixer and the second is a vision mixer. The sound mixer needs to have mix minus capabilities. So that means it needs to take a number of inputs and choose selectively which inputs go to which outputs. For example, the whole mix of the sound needs to be sent online but a separate mix without the Zoom audio needs to be sent back to the Zoom room. If we sent back their voice, they'll get feedback. It's terrible. BSA uses the Zoom LiveTrack L8. Zoom, Zoom, yeah, sorry, don't get confused. I'll just call it the L8. So this is a really great portable solution. It's got eight inputs and eight outputs. It's great value, well-reviewed, and does everything we need to do. Now, if you have a whole band, you might need to spend more. But for this setup, without considerations, I'm not sure if this can be beat on the market at the moment. And obviously, if you already have an audio mixer set up, you can work out how to use that for this purpose. But for the L8, it gives you a TR-SS cable that plugs into your computer jack. So this is already mix minus, so you can send a feed of everything you're capturing from the L8 in the room to Zoom, whilst also bringing back the Zoom audio into the L8, which you can then selectively push out into the room. And since we don't need amplification from the front, we don't need to include that, but we could if we wanted to. Then to output all the sound together into our stream or our recording for later, we wanna bring that audio complete mix into our vision mixer. We're gonna do this through a dual XLR to 3.5 millimeter cable. Now, the second cornerstone of their setup is... Okay, hang on a second, sidebar. So, um, BSA have done a great work of their setup. They use 90% of it, but they created it before the ATEM Extreme ISO came out. They're actually using both an ATEM Mini and an ATEM Mini Pro together. The reason for that is they needed to be able to control what was on the front of house screen. 
So switching sources to turn on or off the Zoom show, this setup using an additional ITEM Mini gave them the second HDM out just for the TV. Now the Extreme actually simplifies this whole setup. So that's what I'm going to recommend. The Extreme has a switcher within the switcher because it has two HDMI outs. You can program either of them to do anything you want. With one of those HDMI outs, we can solve the job of controlling what goes on the front of house screen. The second HDMI out, we're gonna use to show our multicam monitor. This will let your switcher know exactly what's on each camera, why to switch to each one. You could also use this multicam view for the speakers up the front as a confidence monitor. One way to do that would be to use a monitor that has HDMI loop out. That's just one way to do it. So we've got our three cameras, they come in via HDMI. Now, you don't need three cameras in this setup. At minimum, I think you only need two. One for someone up the front and one for the room if it's a workshop and we need to see the participants in real time on Zoom. Speaking of which, we want to output a HDMI from the Zoom computer into the ATEM so we can capture it. There is a bit more to this with Zoom, but we're gonna come back to that. The fifth HDMI input is an optional one if a speaker is gonna use a presentation. Now, technically it's possible to run the presentation off the same laptop as the Zoom laptop, but just for ease of use and switching, it's better to have them separate. With one of the USB-C outs, we connect to the Zoom laptop. And this is how we're feeding everything that's coming into the vision switcher into Zoom. Now, you remember that we're actually feeding Zoom the audio and the video separately from separate sources. We'll get into the Zoom setup again. I'm getting onto that too early. The second USB-C out is for an SSD hard drive. And if you have the ATEM Extreme ISO, which I suggest, when you hit record, it will record every HDMI input. So your Zoom participants, your presentation screen, and your cameras. So at the end of the workshop, you'll have a recording with every cut that you've sent to the live stream. Plus you'll get an edit file that will let you finesse those files because you have an ISO or isolated file of every HDMI input. From the ATEM, we're feeding out into YouTube Live to live stream directly from the box by plugging it into your internet router. And that's the complete diagram. It'll work with any kind of camera. There's so many versions of this, but if you want to download these diagrams, a kit list, plus see some bonus info in writing about how to set it up, you can sign up to our email list below and I'll send it to you. Just click the link in the description below. And if you want to learn more about the ATEM Extreme cameras or anything live stream related, we also have a complete course that's aimed at small to medium churches who want to get the most out of the limited resources that they have. Since you're already here and learning, I want to give you a discount by using the coupon that's below. Now I should talk about the 20 of this 8020 setup. There are a couple of limitations, but we can get around them. Either you can have a boatload of money or we could do a few savvy things. One of the limitations is with the Zoom participants, they're seeing the full program feed of the ATEM Extreme. So as in anything that you shoot to the live stream, they're gonna see because you can't switch to individual channels over the USB-C. If you want to show the Zoom speaker as the primary speaker, that means that they're gonna see themselves in the Zoom room if you choose to show them in the room on the front of house TV or on the live stream. They're getting a visual feedback loop and it's unfortunate if they see themselves. Now, if you've got a full Zoom room full of lots of people, this probably isn't gonna to be too much of an issue, but if you have a high profile speaker, they're gonna to wanna to see the room and feed off their reactions. The simplest way around this is just to set up a phone or another computer to log into Zoom and face that at the audience. So not a great camera, you're not gonna cut it into your show, but it's just there so that the speaker can see the audience. You wanna also make sure that the speaker's turned off and it's muted, so it's just a visual camera feed going to Zoom. You don't wanna create feedback by having two devices on Zoom in the same space. 
If you wanted to as well and you had a camera just for the audience, instead you could put a HDMI splitter out of the camera uh, and a cheap capture card and another computer connected to Zoom. So this computer would just see the audience from a better camera. And then anyone on Zoom will always be able to see the audience in the room. Now I wanna talk about the role of the switcher. You've actually got three different switching jobs for this. So it will be a muscle that needs to be refined so that you can just have your mind across all of these things. So the first way that you're switching is through the camera sources. You're switching on the big buttons on the box between the cameras, the Zoom participants, and a presentation. This creates your program feed. And you're sending your program feed out to the Zoom participants and also live to your online viewers. The second way you're switching is with the mini switcher in the ATEM Extreme for your HDMI out. This is gonna control what goes on the front of house screen. So you might wanna to switch to just a logo when the Zoom room doesn't need to be seen. Or you might wanna switch back to the Zoom room or switch to slides, graphics, animation loops. Anything that you want to feed to that, you can through this box. The third way of switching is with Zoom. So the way we're gonna set up Zoom for this is we're gonna make Zoom see and think that the ATEM Extreme is a second monitor, because it is. So whether you're on a Mac, you need to set up extended displays or the same thing for Windows. We're not duplicating or mirroring here. Then in Zoom, we wanna set up dual monitor display. This way, the switcher can always have a gallery view of everyone there, but when someone is speaking primarily, the switcher can pin that specific person to the front screen. Zoom can do a pretty good job of auto switching between Zoom participants, but if you want that greater control and want to ensure one participant goes up on the front of house screen, you can right click on them and pin them to the second screen. The second screen is what we're putting into the ATEM Extreme, which we can then output again into the front of house. You want to select your camera as the Blackmagic Design option. And to give your Zoom audience the best experience, make sure in the video settings you select HD and turn mirroring off so the presentations aren't mirrored. For audio, you're going to make sure your input and output is the Live Track L8. Because as we've gone over, that's going to handle all the mixing and the mix minusing. Since all our microphone inputs are mixed beforehand, we can turn off any settings we want. You can even turn the option on to turn original audio on. So that means Zoom won't do anything to your audio. This might give your Zoom participants better audio, but they might not have great audio themselves, so they might wanna keep that on their side. Zoom is great because everyone uses it and it's very easy to integrate with a large group. But if you only have a few guests and want a bit more control over the UI, then there are a few other options. You could use Skype's Creator NDI features, Studio 6 by Vimeo or vMix. These are all paid. A free one is OBS Ninja, which is open source, but does work very well. So you're switching for the Zoom participants and the live stream at the same time, and you're switching for what's shown on the TV. It's a muscle, it might seem tricky at first, but slowly it'll become second nature. This setup can be scaled up or down, left or right, do whatever you want. But let us know in the comments what you hope to do with something like this. I think we're just beginning to imagine what's possible with interactivity of both people online and in the room. Usually there've been two completely isolated parties. So we're just stumbling upon the future together and I don't think we've even hit the limits of what we can do with this kind of thing. Anyway, that's it for the video. Don't forget to click on the email list so you can download the diagrams or check out the course if you're interested. I'll see you around.